husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. Alamo Heights is a portion of San Antonio, Texas that is described as an old money neighborhood. The Edwards were an affluent Texas family who resided in the Alamo Heights area. Dana Claire Edwards was a sixth generation Texan. She's a descendant from Jacob Warsbach, who came to Texas as the civil engineer for the German immigration company for Fredericksburg. She went to St. Mary's High School but transferred and graduated from Fredericksburg High School. She went on to graduate summa cum laude from Texas Tech University, and her next educational goal was to attend medical school with dreams of becoming a surgeon. Tragically, after only one year, she had to drop out after getting into a car accident that left her with five broken vertebrae in her neck and a serious spinal cord injury. After recovering, she earned her MBA with highest honors from Texas Tech University. Afterward, she decided to move back to San Antonio and work for her family's construction business, becoming a talented home designer. She loved animals and had a Jack Russell Terrier named Grit, who was her constant companion. Thomas Ford also grew up in the Alamo Heights area, working for his family's construction business. The two started dating in 2007. Dana was around 29 years old and Thomas around 38. Things went great for the next two and a half years of dating. But Dana started to realize that they were wanting different things and were drifting apart because of it. Thomas was looking to go back to school for a career change to become certified as a teacher. And Dana was looking to get married, have kids, and settle down. So she decided it was best to end the relationship, which she did in September of 2008. Thomas was heartbroken, which he explained in a letter he sent to Dana after their breakup on October 1st. I am deeply saddened, hurt, and disappointed at the sudden termination of our relationship. I have not been able to sleep because I just lie in bed crying over this tremendous loss and loneliness I now feel. I can hardly make it through the day without emotions taking over. I feel as though our relationship has been taken away from me. I wish you would reconsider. You are the person I want to spend the rest of my life with and raise a family with. Dana did not like hurting Thomas, but felt this was the right decision, and the two decided to remain friends as they ran in the same circles in Alamo Heights. Thomas decided to throw himself a 40th birthday party on October 17th. He invited Dana to the celebration. Alan Traver, one of Thomas's lifelong friends, explained that the night was amazingly civil between the two exes. They next saw each other at a Halloween party Alan's girlfriend, Melissa Fetterspills, was hosting at her dog wash shop. On December 20th, Dana, Thomas, Melissa, Alan, and a few other friends decided to rent a limo and drive around looking at Christmas lights. Thomas accompanied Dana home to her apartment that evening. He then invited Dana to his house on the 23rd to give her a Christmas present. But when Dana got there, he was really emotional and told her he was really struggling with their breakup, saying he knew he wanted to be with her for the rest of his life and asked to get back together. Dana ended up staying at Thomas's house for five hours. Later, she explained to her mom, Deborah, that it had been a really hard meeting 
He was going on and on and crying, and she was worried, and she said, Finally, I just had to leave, Mother. She also spoke with Melissa after that evening's events, explaining how emotional Thomas was. This prompted Alan to call Thomas and let him know that Dana would be attending the New Year's Eve party he was also planning to go to, but Thomas said he was fine, with Alan later stating, it didn't seem to faze him at all. Dana was excited for the New Year's Eve party and for what the next year had to offer. As she was getting ready for New Year's Eve in her condo, her parents came by to say goodbye to her as they were headed to the family ranch. Deborah later saying, I went in and told her, I said, we're going to go to the ranch a day early. And she said, let me walk you to your car, mom. She gave me a big hug and a kiss, stood at the car door and said, y'all have fun. I'll call ya. This was the last conversation Daryl and Deborah Edwards would ever have with their daughter. There were two parties going on that night, one at Mary Miner's house and the other at Robert Grog's. The plan was for all four, Dana, Melissa, Alan, and Thomas, to end up at Mary's party, but the two guys would first hang out for a bit at Roger's house. So Melissa dropped Alan off at Roger's before making her way to Mary's party. Dana ended up showing up to the party around 8.30 p.m., while Alan was still waiting for Thomas at Roger's place. He texts him, Dude, I am at Roger's. Don't de esta? But Thomas was headed to Mary's house to drop off crab dip when he got the text, but called once at the house letting Alan know he was on his way. The guys stayed at Roger's house for a few hours before Thomas drove them both back over to the party at Mary's. This particular party was a more intimate gathering of just close friends, hanging out and playing board games. Everyone was having an enjoyable time until they started to play a game of apples to apples, which is a game of green and red cards, explained like this. The judge picks up a green apple card from the top of the stack, reads the word aloud, and places it face up on the table. Then the other players, except the judge, quickly choose the red apple card from their hand that is best described by the word on the green apple card played by the judge. An example, the green card, risky. The red cards played, Bates Motel, Bigfoot, the YMCA, and cocaine. The goals for the judge of that round to pick the red card that best fits the description of the green card, but it depends on the judge if they are going to go the serious route or funny route on what they pick as the best card. While playing this game that night, Melissa decided to do a half funny, half serious with the green card she drew while she was the judge. From the stack, she ended up picking the card with the word marriage written on it. She decided to take this opportunity to poke fun at both her boyfriend, Alan, and Thomas who both seemed to have a less than enthusiastic approach on this subject. Melissa pointed at both men and said, this one is for y'all, then slammed the card down on the table. Laughter erupted from everyone, except Thomas, who got up and asked Melissa to come sit by him and explained that the joke rubbed him the wrong way. After this incident, Thomas decided to leave the party, not bothering to stay and ring in the new year with his friends. When Alan noticed he was gone, he sent him a text at 11.31 p.m. asking why he left, and Thomas replied back, no longer fun. Alan's next text was asking whether he was headed back to Roger's party, but never got a response. So Alan called 15 minutes later but the call went to voicemail. Alan, Melissa, and Dana all left the party around 12.45 a.m. Dana Claire headed home 
while the other two drove to Thomas's place to drop off his cooler of beer. But his white Chevy Tahoe was not parked at either of his normal spots, which is normally at the end of his driveway or in the church parking lot behind his house. So they didn't stop and just kept driving back to their place. They got home shortly after 1 a.m., and Alan tried contacting Thomas again, sending him this text. Yo, your beer is with us. Talk to you manana. When Dana got home, she wanted to take her dogs out on a quick walk before heading to bed, as she was planning to get up the next morning to drive to her parents' ranch in Fredericksburg. But morning came, and her parents were surprised she hadn't made it to the ranch yet. After calling her continually New Year's Day and getting no response, they knew something was wrong. They got in their car and drove straight to Dana's condo, hoping for a misunderstanding, but thinking of the worst possibilities. Daryl opened the door and yelled for his daughter, but he heard nothing in return, not even from the dogs. Once he walked in the door, he saw his daughter laying face down, covered in blood, in the doorway between the bathroom and her office space. Her face was covered with a towel, and her body was cold. Then Dana's dog, Toby, a Maltese, who is a recent addition to our family, crawled out from his hiding spot, visibly shaken. But Grit was missing. Deborah then came in and saw her daughter, later explaining, and I kneeled on the floor next to her and pushed the towel off of her head and looked at her beautiful green eyes. I have no idea how long I was there. It was till the police made me get up and leave. The police arrived around 2.30 a.m. on January 2nd. Looking around, there did not seem to be any forced entry. Nothing looked to be stolen. Just a few blood droplets, a rolled up carpet, and a room in disarray. Police first thought Dana Claire had fallen and hit her head on the sink and considered the case to be an accidental death. But that was quickly ruled out a few hours later after an autopsy was conducted and they learned Dana died from ligature strangulation and had also been hit in the head repeatedly. Her death was then ruled a homicide. As word spread in their community, friends came to comfort the Edwards family. One of those people was Thomas. Deborah said, he gave me a hug and he kind of stood around and talked to a few people. He wouldn't look at me. He wouldn't look me in the eyes. Dana Claire's friend Cornelia said, when I heard, I just knew it had been deeply personal just because of the way the killing was perpetrated. So of course, the first person the police looked at was her ex-boyfriend, Thomas Ford. The detectives called him in for questioning the next day. Thomas agreed to be interviewed without a lawyer. Here's some audio from that police interview. I'm just trying to think of some... I mean, do you have any idea why somebody would have... No. Wanted to hurt her? No, I have no idea. This party that y'all were at could have been the last place. Um... She was seen, you know, alive. I mean, we don't know that, but we're just trying to fill in the spaces, you know, where right. she could have been. I know. New Year's Day, did you ever call her that day? Because you're now in Rockport now, right? You leave to Rockport on the the first. Did you call her or text her that day? Like, no. Okay. At all? No. Okay. No. Anything else happen that day, that night? Mm. No. Okay. Any questions for me that I can uh, try to answer? I can. I'm kind of limited, but well, I know. Yeah, I know you're limited, but no, I, I, I just can't think of anything else. 
that uh, it stands out. Okay. So if you think of something, uh, just you know, tr- troubleshooting this this incident going through your mind, okay. something that might. Have, hey, I remember this, or she told me that. Uh, okay. Something. As minor as it might be, just just call me. Okay. Because those little things make a might make a big difference later. Well, I'll d- anything, yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming in, Tony. Thank you, sir. I hope this helps. Well, every bit does, because uh, uh, I need to speak with everybody. Yeah. So, every bit will start putting the pieces together. Thomas Ford. It's been tough. Detective. Sure. Sure. Do you have any idea why somebody would have... No. Wanted to hurt her? No, I I have no idea. The detective questioned Ford about the New Year's party he and Dana Claire both attended just hours before she was killed. Ford said he left the party before midnight and went to sleep shortly after that. Detective. Okay. So you go home, change, and within a few minutes you're out? Thomas. I go straight home. Yeah. Changed. Watched a little TV and went to bed. They then ended the interview and went to work on verifying Thomas's alibi. Unfortunately for Thomas, his alibi wasn't looking too good after a few days. The police were able to find surveillance footage from the drive through exit camera of a First National Bank that was across the street from Dana's complex. Although the tape was grainy, one could make out a white SUV, the same type as what Thomas drove. According to Detective Carrion, the camera captured footage of a white SUV go in and out of Gallery Court, which is the name of Dana's condo complex, moments after Thomas had left the New Year's Eve party. At 11.24 p.m., a white SUV traveling south on New Braunfels crossed Nacogdoches and turned into Gallery Court and exited two minutes later. Then, at 11.26 p.m., the white SUV passed by Gallery Court again, pulling into the complex at 11.27 p.m., before exiting again at 11.30 p.m. and heading north on New Braunfels toward Nacogdoches. A few moments later, the vehicle disappeared from view. The camera captured a person walking from the north of the intersection traveling south on the sidewalk. This person wore light-colored pants and a dark top. The person entered the complex at Gallery Court at 11.42 p.m. At 1 a.m., Dana Claire's red Chevy Tahoe entered Gallery Court from the north. A little after 1, Dana Claire's neighbor, Jordan, said that he was out walking his dogs and saw Dana Claire walking her dogs, Grit and Toby, early that morning. The same figure that was seen entering Gallery Court at 11.42 p.m. walked out of the complex and headed north on New Braunfels just a few minutes after 2 o'clock a.m. At 2.07 a.m., a white SUV was again seen headed south on New Braunfels. Then at 3.12 a.m., the SUV later appeared heading north on New Braunfels, this time with its lights off, and again pulled into Gallery Court, exiting again at 3.16 a.m. Police believed the figure to be Thomas, based on his description of what he wore that evening. Detective, do you remember what you were wearing that night? Thomas, jeans, a red shirt, and a tan vest. He also stated his fairly new BlackBerry phone had been in his possession the entire night and that no one else had used his phone or driven his white Chevy Tahoe except him. And although Thomas was cooperating with police, that all ended in the weeks after the murder when investigators asked for the clothes he wore that night. 
but he refused to turn them over and then promptly hired a lawyer. Before I go into this next part, I wanted to give a warning that I will be discussing an animal death. All right, back to the show. Two weeks later, on January 7th, 2009, the battered remains of Dana's dog, Grit, were found about two miles from her house, near the Olmus Dam. Grit appeared to have been dropped from the Olmus Basin Overlook because he was found directly below the pull-off parking for mechanics that work on the dam. This was further evidence that the attack on Dana was very personal because they also killed her closest dog companion. January 14th, cell phone records were requested by the San Antonio District Attorney's Office. They filed an application under Article 18.21 of the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure and in accordance with the Stored Communications Act for four days worth of historical cell site location information for Thomas Ford's cell phone from AT&T Wireless. The police had very important information in these cell records, but failed to truly analyze them. So Thomas was still walking around as a free man. Deborah was convinced of Thomas's guilt and decided she would take matters into her own hands to try and help push Thomas to come forward. February 14th, 2009 was the first time she sent him a letter. It was a Valentine's Day card with the words, I'm thinking of you. On Mother's Day, she sent him a letter that read, Mother's Day, never the same. Here are some of the other letters she sent. How long were you planning this murder? The tile is so cold. Happy anniversary. The evil in your soul sustains you. Remember how you ended her life? Another card read with a photo enclosed with the words, Happy New Year, Dana Claire as a child. Nancy Ford, Thomas's mother, said Deborah Edwards also began to send her threatening notes and made a series of phone calls accusing her son of the murder. Later when asked if she thought what she did was an unusual move, Deborah responded, I don't know. What does a mother do when she's seen her daughter laying in a pool of blood? At the beginning of 2010, nearly one year after the murder, police finally got the break they needed. DNA that was found on the towel that covered Dana Claire's face was consistent with Thomas Ford. The police arrested Thomas and charged him with the murder of Dana Claire Edwards. The lawyer Thomas hired to represent him in his murder trial was Dick DeGurian, who had represented clients such as Robert Durst and David Koresh. He's a huge name in the Texas legal system and made the prosecutors feel like the underdogs when it came to going up against him in trial. Prosecutor Melton knew very well what they would be up against. While in law school, Dick DeGurian was her professor in her class, Advanced Criminal Defense. From the beginning, I did not doubt that John Thomas Ford was guilty, said Prosecutor Catherine Babbitt. But when Babbitt got the case, she and her two colleagues knew proving Ford guilty would be difficult, not just because of the defense attorney, but because of how the case was mishandled. In processing the scene, The officers did not use booties, and some things were not collected for days. They lost the first crime scene sketch. They lost her underwear. They also lost some surveillance tape that had a clearer picture than the one that they had. They also lost the victim's right-hand fingernail clippings. A report also indicated that a sample from the white towel was inconclusive, when in fact, 
it was very conclusively not the DNA of John Thomas Ford, and very conclusively the DNA of Bear County forensic scientist Robert Sailors. Although there seemed to be nothing missing from the condo, the Edwards would eventually notice two things missing. A very heavy, antique, three-hole punch that had belonged to Elizabeth Edwards' mother, and a power cord used to charge a cordless electric drill. The trial started in 2011. Here are a few highlights from the trial. First, Thomas Ford did not testify, but all he said in the police interviews were able to be entered into trial, and what he said during this interview would prove to be his downfall. This is part of that police interview. Thomas, I want you all to know that I will do everything to help out. Detective, okay. Did anybody else use your phone that night? No, that would have been impossible. Once you went home from the party, you went straight home? Yeah, I go straight home. The prosecution knew that the cell phone data they obtained back in January 2009 would help them to hopefully win this case. But the value of the cell records only became known right before trial. When they looked over the cell records, which... If you remember earlier, the police subpoenaed, but had never fully analyzed. Kenneth Dahl, the director of radio network engineering for the AT&T Wireless Network in South Texas, testified about these records. He explained that each cell phone tower had three coverage areas referred to as sectors. When a person sets up a call, receives a call, or sends a text, The person does so in communication with one of those sectors in the cell phone network. This enables the cell phone service provider to look up the records for a particular phone number and determine a particular cell phone's proximity to a cell phone tower during a particular communication session. This is also true even if the person does not answer a phone call. Unanswered texts and calls and automatic internet downloads or uploads cause the device to connect with or ping the network to alert the network that the cellular device is in a particular service area. According to Dahl's research, there were 14 pings from Thomas's cell phone during the time span of 8.10 p.m. on December 31, 2008 to 9.43 a.m., on January 1st, 2009. Twelve of the pings were text or phone calls to or from Alan Traver. One was a download from the internet, and one was an active call to voicemail. Kenneth Dahl arranged these pings into 10 events, which he then summarized, stating that events 5 and 6 did not go along with the alibi that Thomas gave to police claiming he was home asleep. Dahl explained that event 5 showed that when Alan called Thomas at 11.45 p.m. and sent a text to him at 1.19 a.m., Thomas's phone pinged off a tower, which was the best server for gallery court, further stating it was simply not possible that Thomas's phone was at his home at that time. Dahl based his opinion on the fact that Thomas's address, 333 Rosemary, had three potential servers, SX3109-1, SX3109-2, and 3X133-3. Because it sat on the border of towers SX3109 and 3X0133, but the gallery court complex had only one, SX3155-2. Even more evidence, the gallery court server did not have a line of sight to the 333 Rosemary address because the terrain drops off as you get toward his house from the north, which is what prevented the line of sight condition. 
so the only explanation for this would be that his cell phone was near Gallery Court. He said the same for the pings from the 11.45 p.m. call, the 1.19 a.m. text, and the 1.32 a.m. data connection. The 1.32 a.m. ping near the Olmus Dam was significant because that is where police recovered the body of Dana Claire's dog, Grit, on January 7th. Other testimony of note was about the surveillance footage. Prosecutor Babbitt explaining, if you just looked at that tape, not knowing anything, and you saw a white SUV come in, two minutes later come out, head south, come back, come in, come out, head north, your first thought is, what's that guy doing? I mean, are they casing the joint? What's going on here? When you put that with the time he says he left the party, that's when you sort of start to build that timeline. Defense attorney says, as blurry as the pictures are, nobody can tell anything about that car. Detective Carrion agreed that no one could definitively say that the white SUV belonged to Thomas or that he was the figure seen walking in the surveillance video. He also acknowledged that there were dozens of white Tahoes, or at least vehicles that look very similar to white Tahoes, that traveled down and up New Braunfels just in the six hours that they concentrated on. But there was the same one that keeps going in and out of Gallery Court, further stating he recognized Thomas's Tahoe because of its characteristics. No luggage rack, side railings, black trim around the side, black handles, black rearview mirrors, and black tailgate lift handles. Deliberations began following three hours of closing arguments, where prosecutors argue jurors can believe Thomas Ford or they can believe the cell phone records, but they can't believe both. Dick DeGurine's last words to the jury was that the evidence leaves more than enough reasonable doubt. And after four weeks, the jury was sent back to determine the fate of Thomas Ford. The jury was initially split down five different directions. Some were even quoted later, with one stating, I just wasn't convinced that he was guilty. And another juror explaining, I just couldn't say that he was guilty beyond reasonable doubt at that point. I needed to sleep on it. The jurors were at an impasse and were dismissed for the night. When they came back the next morning, they sent a note asking to review the cell phone evidence. After eight hours, the jurors finally reached a unanimous verdict. They found John Thomas Ford guilty of murder. And after one hour, the jury came back with a sentence of 40 years in prison. Thomas did appeal this conviction, bringing up specifically that obtaining the cell phone records was a violation of his Fourth Amendment rights. He also went to court asking for the judge to waive a $15,000 bill for the transcript from his month-long trial. But the judge denied the request after about two hours of testimony in which prosecutors suggested Ford's father was hiding assets to make the defendant look less wealthy, perhaps in an effort to shield him from a potential wrongful death lawsuit. Prosecution also argued, you just can't ask for a taxpayer-funded transcript after you have a trial where you have retained one of the top lawyers in the country. That is patently unfair. His appeals were also denied. I guess what was a little bit of amazing was I could feel all my daughter's good memories come back to me without Thomas in all of that. I felt like I had her back, said Deborah after the verdict was read. DJ, Dana Clare's brother, set up a memorial to help remember both Dana Clare and her dog, Grit. They did this by having puppies from the local animal shelter available for adoption 
at Dana Claire's memorial service. I know that she was happy when she was looking down on us and seeing those sweet little animals being offered a second chance, her friend Cornelia continued, and it was very special. It was so Dana. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstuart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.